Hey everyone, welcome to Overseas Famous uh, Podcast. This is uh, one of our interview segments. We are here uh, with Robert Healy. Robert is an author, uh, professor, jack of all trades. Um, and I always like, Robert, like when we talk about uh, authors who who also, I, I love the author professor thing. Like that's what I'm aspiring to be. <laughs> like, I think it's an <laughs> incredible thing right. uh, to be able to teach. Cause I teach currently, you know, younger kids, but to have that, that whole entire uh, being able to really teach the kids who are so close to being able to get where they want to get. I mean, when you teach sixth graders, like you're like, in about 10 years, there's going to be some real stuff you're going to have to do. But right now, just stop throwing stuff and just pay yeah. attention. Like you're trying to teach life skills, but like having that so close is so interesting and cool to me to be that professor and to kind of be the uh, to the author professor. Yeah, it's, it's, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? Because I have two young kids and when they're that young, you're just keeping them alive. Yours aren't, <laughs> ones, you're, ones you're teaching aren't that much older. My kids are eight and five and there's not, okay. much, not much I can teach them right now about the world other than this little box that they call you know home in the bus and school but yeah when you have college age students you're dealing with adults young adults mostly who are just on the precipice of starting their careers you know one of whom works on this podcast with you right Michaela yeah so and she's a good example of someone who asked the right questions at a certain age when she got to college tried to make connections and, and start her career and then she's she's gone on and has done that and you know she'll be graduating very soon finally from the master's program but yeah, I mean, everybody from age 18 to 24, 25, basically by the time they leave here, if they go to grad school, they grow so much and we're with them through that entire process. Like I've been here for seven years now. So I've seen some of these students now for, you know, five, six years, and it's awesome to watch them grow and start their careers and just take things that you had just told them, you know, four years ago that they're now doing professionally. It's really rewarding. So the, the cool, really cool thing is, is what you've done for Duquesne University. Um, you you really founded this whole entire uh, sports media division that you guys have that Michaela works for, um, which I, like for me as as a guy who love who's you know really big into the media, who uh, had a minor in you know public relations and communicate had a communications minor, and I always thought that was so fascinating the broadcasting and the TV and the, and the things that you you guys are doing with this program. I mean, I only live vicariously through Michaela. So I see all the stuff that she has set up in these, all these classes. It's just fascinating to kind of have it, not just media, but like specifically with sports. How did that kind of come to be? Was that like a difficult journey to get someone, you know, someone to buy in and be like, listen, we want to, we want media, but it's all sports media because there's such a, a need and there's such a growth in that industry. So for me, it was just, looking at what Duquesne University already had to offer and where it was located and all the partnerships we already had. And then looking at the existing talent that we had on faculty and just looking at, well, what can we do with what we already have that's not going to require us to invest in more faculty or build more classrooms or start new classes. So I looked at our journalism curriculum, I looked at our public relations curriculum, and I looked at these few sports media classes we had that students were just taking as basically electives or to fill like a little tiny concentration that would show up on their um, transcript. And I saw the existing expertise on staff, including myself, and thought, there's no reason why we can't have a fourth major in this department. And I called it sports information and media. Basically, I, I took samples from journalism, samples from PR, and then I took the existing four sports specific courses and put those in there and then suggested a couple of elective students could take and built the program up um, based on the fact that we're an NCAA Division I school. We have spectator sports like FCS football and then Atlantic 10 men's and women's basketball. In addition to all of the Olympic sports, the soccer, lacrosse, swimming's, right, track and field. So we have this Division I setting here, and we have the opportunity to host March Madness at PPG Paints Arena, which we almost routinely do now. Um, and so we can give students these experiences that are big time American sports. And also we live in a major league city. So the Pittsburgh Penguins are a stone's throw across the street. They're constantly asking myself and my colleagues for students to go work there. We have a few there right now. And then the Steelers, of course, are, are the Rooney family are Duquesne people. So, you know, my first break out of grad school was to go work for the Steelers uh, and being a Duquesne person, no doubt helped. They come to us and ask for those kind of top students to recommend. 
And then obviously you have the Pirates and then the minor league Riverhounds right here in town. So being in a major league sports city and having the existing um, Division I university athletics program and then having the, um, uh, the expertise on staff, myself as a former sports information director and as a sports reporter, and then all the talented journalists and PR professionals we already have in the faculty, there was no, it was no reason not to. And, uh, you know, it's gone so well that it's now our second most popular major in our, in our department. And it's only been offered as a major for about four years. Wow. So I don't see the reason why that doesn't continue to grow, uh, become one of the most popular majors the university is going to have. It's really our chance to carve a niche. No one else in the region has a sports information major and very few in the entire country do. When you were pitching the idea of a sports a media major, uh, did you look at any other schools or uh, to get any ideas of what you wanted to do, how you, how you wanted to build this program? That's a good question. It, answer honestly is no. It's, I wanted to make it unique. It, it, uh, there's not really anything that another school is doing in sports information that would stood out as something that we need to aspire to. It's really my own idea. So with... Um, you know, with it being sports information and media as the title, my concept was when you apply for a job in sports media, right? And that's, there's, you know how competitive that's going to be, right? You know how many people want to work in sports if they can't make it as professional athletes, they want to be professionals in athletics. So they go work in ticketing, sales, marketing, fan experience, or they try to work for the team, you know, in some way, putting out content in some way. Well, anybody who puts out content on behalf of the team in college, that's known as sports information. And anybody who does it as for a professional team, whether they got that job via teamworkonline.com or they got that job through some sort of connection, all those people who've done that professionally know what a sports information director does at the college level. And many of them came from the college ranks and then got the pro job later. So to have a major that says the title sports information in it, the full title is sports information and media, since we're also training sports media journalists and broadcasters who may just uh, bypass the PR and just be reporters in, in sports, that's fine. We train for both. But that sports information term that's in the major, we look at somebody hiring from a professional team or a college anywhere in the country, and they're going to say, here's a stack of journalism kids, communication kids, here's a stack of PR kids, all these resumes and, and transcripts are the same. But then there's a, a kid who majored in sports information and media, and as someone who's hired for those jobs, I'm, I'm going to go shoot. That's what the that's what the job is called. So it's it's very much like, you know, almost like if you want to hire a forklift operator and they come to you with their forklift operation certification, they're going to get the job over someone who just like majored in, you know, industry or whatever, you know, or majored in business. So we wanted to give them a, a job that's really practical and experience that's practical. So we even teach our classes, not just to learn how to write and how to understand PR and values, but also to know the infield fly role to know what's an assist in lacrosse versus what's an assist in soccer or ice hockey. So we do the stats and the rules in the class too, so that you're getting very hands-on tangible experience, sometimes even in the press box with our athletics department to know what counts as what and how to communicate those things, either as a journalist or in PR. So we, we sort of built it on our own with a totally carte blanche. Um, I was inspired by, by hearing about sports information majors around across the country, but I didn't actually base it off of a template that existed. Was it a difficult pitch to the administration to add the extra major or were they pretty much bought in after you explained the whole, your whole idea? No, it wasn't as difficult as you'd think. And the reason was our chair was really on board with it. So our chair is the one who more or less hired me after um, I got laid off as a news reporter in Pittsburgh. I worked for the patch media group, which was part of the Huffington post and um, AOL used to own it. And I was a reporter in the South Hills of Pittsburgh, and the guy who was um, the chair of the department at the time was a reader of mine because he lived in the South Hills. And so he had read my work and I was his TA in grad school. So when I got laid off, he basically got me off the pile and got me to teach journalism here and PR for about two or three years. And then after those two or three years, I saw the curriculum came at that from my sports media reporting experience and from my prior sports information experience and said, you know, his name's Dr. Dillon, Mike Dillon. I said, Mike, there's no reason why we can't add a major without having to hire anybody new, without having to create new classes, it already exists. So, you know, all it's gonna do is create more students, right? More revenue for the university, more opportunities for our students. It fits into our mission statement. That's, we wanna serve God by serving students at Duquesne University. And this is a, another way to do that. And so 
when you look at it that way on paper, it made total sense, black and white dollars and cents, you know, the, the figures, it was just more students. That's, that's great. We can already do it with what we have. And that's why it's worked. I love the, uh, the forklift operator. Have you ever watched the British office? Yeah. 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 As soon as you said that, I was like, oh, forklift operator. <laughs> it's a specific skill set, right? It you, is. you have to, you got your certification and you can do it. We yeah. think, we think it's, it's one thing, it's great to leave a school with this knowledge of the art of communication and the philosophy of human communication. And that's terrific. That's actually my background as an undergrad. But to actually get your hands on the topics and create something, and then to know specifically the, the nuances of the rules and the stats and what's an RBI versus, you know, what is an error versus what's a, how does the shot clock differ from NBA to college? You know, those things you can't really get, um, it, through through deep knowledge of philosophy it's really just practical and so we sell it to parents that way too you know we one of our recent graduates is the um football communications coordinator for the tampa bay buccaneers you know and he's got his super bowl rig and you know we take a picture of that and we show everybody says this could be you you know and, and i come from that world where you're on the team you work for the team um it's a way to stay competitive if you love sports stay working for the the organization but but mimic journalism to your audience so we, we teach regular old journalism here. And then we also teach branded journalism that you're doing on behalf of a team as like a content writer, you know, and then you can get that knowledge of that sport through classes we offer. You can't go work for an NBA team, for example, and not know how the shot clock works or how many timeouts there are and fouls. You're going to look silly or out of place. So you've got to know that too. It's like having your certification almost. I like, it's almost like, uh, you know, we talked about, it's almost creating that breeding ground for, uh, the next level sports uh, information people, media people, which is so important. You kind of compare it to what goes on with like, even what's going on with college basketball at Duquesne. These guys are being prepared for that next level. Uh, if that's the jump that they're going to take. And meanwhile, you have this course that's preparing these uh, young, young men and women for, you know, that step. And I just, I think it's so important too. And every major city should have this, where you have that connection to the Penguins and the Pirates and uh, and the Steelers, like it's just it's it's such a such a necessity, and I think you just put yourself so much higher than anyone else in that field uh, or those kids. Or like, is there a stigma with the Duquesne graduates where it's like they know their shit? Like you're they're going to come out and it's like that they almost have that like you you go to Duquesne you know what you're talking about. You're in a good program. You know what you're talking about. Like kind of like how a kid would come from Duke and be like, okay, here's what his tangibles or intangibles are going to be. This one guy went here. Ben Simmons goes to LSU. So like, I'm just going to try to throw Ben Simmons jokes in as much as I can. So, uh, <laughs> that, but like those intangibles that your kids have, does that mean something out in the world uh, of media? Yeah, I see what you mean. That, that'd be the dream, right? I mean, that, that'd be the brand. Like, we we want to have that brand. So if you're coming from Duquesne University and you majored in sports information and media, your name moves to the top of the list when it comes time to hire people to work for your sports communications office. And I think the reason that happens, not to uh, pat myself on the back or anything, but I teach this as a clinician. So I'm not a PhD, I'm not a scholar. And in the media department at Duquesne University, we're in the College of Liberal Arts. It sounds like you know everybody who teaches here must have this advanced PhD or something, but and do clinical scholarly research and write things that a handful of experts read, and then they say that this guy's an expert, this woman's an expert. That's not what I do professionally. So I moonlight as a sportscaster, as a sports writer, right, writing books, doing broadcasting, doing guest speaking, um, any number of them. I'm also a, a high school baseball umpire. So there's there's things I do this stuff on the side to keep myself current and active, and so. When I teach, it's from a clinician's or a clinical experience, and that's really at the ethos of our department. Even our PhDs were, have, have, were journalists for 20 years, for example. So, you know, we're teaching something that we've actually done. And in my case, when I teach sports information, I'm telling you, here's how you handle a question from a parent who says, you know, my kid's playing time on your stats is off, or this tackle's wrong, you know, or here's how to handle a coach who's coming to you saying, we want you to create a recruiting brochure versus an actual media guide and what that means at the division three level versus the division two or one level. You can only get that if you've done the job, which I have. So I was a division one student athlete, both for a spectator sport and for an Olympic sport. And then I was also a division three sports information director in other parts of the East coast, not just in Pittsburgh. So I, I come from the experience of 
having done a lot in athletics. So here is, here is that experience. Like my kids get that now. My students get that. They're not just getting it out of a book. I'm not a career student. That's not really how our department works. So we, we think, we'd like to think that our brand that's going to continue to get better with this major growing and growing and growing and sending kids all over the country is that, yeah, when you get a kid from Duquesne's media department, they're going to have practical experience. They're not just getting ready for grad school. They're getting ready for their first job as soon as they graduate. I love the that emphasis uh, you're putting on real life experience, which I think, I mean, my personal opinion, I have a friend who's a theology professor at Loyola Chicago. So him and I will debate this all, but like that PhD, you've been in school for so much, so long, you have, you would know, you know, this and that and like books, but like until you're actually there, until you've actually done it, it's hard. I always say like, it's tough even for media people to understand what goes on through an athlete's mind, unless you've kind of been there. Like you were saying, you've, you, you do all these things to stay relevant and keep that relevance and keep that mindset you're around athletes enough where you figure those things out and you're like okay i see why this and i think that's just so important uh and i'd always say like if you're in academia for all this time and you kind of have you know like the pipe and like you know the glasses and the scarf and stuff it's it's it doesn't match that real life experience which i think is like you said that brand that you guys are building is so important because you guys have real life experience you're not it's not like Oh, well, I was in school, like you said, career students, kid, you're almost like an adult student teaching younger students, as opposed to someone who's lived there, who's done this. I think that's like so important. It's like the same as like a basketball trainer. Like, unless you kind of played, like, why are you training me? Like, I don't, it's, these are the things that I think it's just that real life experience is so important. Yeah, uh, it's, it's so much easier to learn from somebody who's been there, done that. I mean, that that's why when you walk into like my office, you're going to see my diplomas, but you're also going to see like my academic All America plaque from track and field. You're going to see a bunch of like sports autographs and sports books because this is my life. You know, it's, we're, we're sports fans too, and we're real people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not teaching out of the textbook. I'm, I'm I'm teaching you what my values are based on my experience. And I want to say there's there's obviously nothing wrong with getting a PhD. I mean, my yeah. colleagues have it, and mo you know they all also come from years of experience, but some don't you know there are there are plenty of examples at universities and colleges throughout the country where some we do there are these career students who are just teaching the next generation of career students and it's just this cycle that doesn't really create anything we actually make things here and you know we we look at our faculty as having to come from practical experience if they don't we don't hire them those are usually the bad guys in movies like all those <laughs> professors that have like have that long like, yeah like Rodney Dangerfield back to school the one who's you know <laughs> I was thinking him and uh, the guy from uh, Finding, uh, what was it? Uh, I can't oh, it was Good, Good Will Hunting? Good Will Hunting is really good. What was the one with uh, Finding Forrester? For some oh, reason, I kept on saying Forgetting Sarah Marshall, which are wildly opposite <laughs> movies. <laughs> but yeah, like that, like kind of uptight. But uh, going into the social media aspect, obviously social media is so big now, especially with an athlete building their brand. We talk a lot about how athletes, even over, especially overseas athletes, how they really have to work even harder to build their brand because their brand is 3,000 miles away, 8,000 miles away. So they have to work harder to build their brand. Uh, so when you guys are, when you're training and teaching uh, this younger generation, uh, is that something that you kind of, you, you, you go into like social media with athletes and how they use it and social media um, with the media and how it's done and how you can kind of, you know, stir, stir things up using social media? Is that a tool that's like really something that you use a lot in your class? Well, at the university at large, the men's basketball team, I don't know if you guys have talked about this on a prior episode or anything, but the men's basketball team hired a name, image, and likeness consultant as an assistant coach. And I think that's a terrific idea um, for the men's basketball it. team, you know, uh, but that, and that's, and they should have done that. And they're, they're going to be on the cutting edge there in terms of what I'm doing in the classroom is I'm not, I have student athletes, but in the classroom, they're just my students. So, you know, for us, we use social media as a storytelling tool. You know, so we we will use social media as a way of telling stories and a way of building a journalist's brand. So ever since I got here, one of the first steps we took in our journalism courses is to make the students create at least a Twitter account as soon as they get in the classroom, because then when we write our stories, they're not just for us to consume in the classroom. They're going to put the link on their Twitter account and tease the story, crowdsource on the account in that medium, and then use Twitter to help create the story and then ultimately get clicks back to the story so everybody gets paid and then we make a living off of this work. So I teach 
social media as a storytelling and brand building tool for journalists and for team, you know, PR accounts. But as for athletics goes, I don't work for the athletics department. I've just witnessed what I think is a terrific idea that the basketball team had to get out in the front of that and have their athletes learn that name, image, and likeness can be something they can take advantage of while they're here. We're going to lure potential student athletes, you know, top players here because of that. I think if you're like a, if you're a five-star recruit or something or four-star recruit out of high school and you want to come play ball here, yeah, it's great that we have the, the brand new Cooper Fieldhouse. It's great that we have LeBron's high school coach, Keith Dambrot, and his great college success. And that's awesome, you know, but at the same time, you're going to have support for the next stage of your career. You're going to have support to become a celebrity while you're on campus. That's, that's the concept. And that's just the reality of where the NCAA is now. Uh, so kudos to them. Yeah, I do love often see. Oh, good, uh, man. Do, you, do you often see a lot of athletes taking the sports media major or is it kind of a 50-50 mix of not athletes and non-athletes? No, I do. Um, I, I've got a bunch of football players um, and basketball players in the court. I mean, soccer as well. Um, you know, I right, stand, stand out for me right now. Those seem to be the big three, a bunch of track athletes. But every time we get a football or basketball player in, in, in class, they're always easy to spot, right, because of their size. And, and we know their names because they're spectator sports. Um, so in that case, those guys are hopeful playing Division One sports that there might be a, a somewhere to go after college to continue to play sports and get paid, whether that be overseas or domestically. Um, but nevertheless, they can still make a career in sports and I show them myself as an example, you know, I didn't go play professional sports. I still stayed athletic and I still exercise and I still play recreational sports. I'm the captain of the Pittsburgh team handball club. You know, I'd say I can, you can still do those things. I still, you know, coach baseball and that kind of thing, but you can be a professional in sports without actually playing the sports. And I think that's what clicks for these guys. They'll come into class and they know that like they might not play professionally or they might just play professionally for a couple of years but they can use their expertise to become a color commentator later and broadcaster. They can use their influence to build a brand that will get their content clicks when they do go to share their opinion. Uh, I think that's the selling point. We do end up with some in sports marketing over in the business school, but that's um, in that department, you have to take calculus and you've got to do, you have to be much more sports minded and mathematical. And that's great. And that's for some people, but in our department, it's about storytellers. And I think many of these athletes, grew up watching sports, listening to these commentators think that's where they, I need to be when I'm retired. I know that's how I got my break was because I started doing radio broadcasting as a color commentator because I was a former division one athlete. So uh, as a, as a personal example, I think they're, that's probably how we're learning some of them. Handball is awesome, by the way. Let's yeah, start, it's, like, it's great. It's such a, it's such a sport. You know, I never really knew what it was. And then when you were playing overseas, a lot of these clubs would have handball. So even like your practice facility would have the extra lines. And I was like, what are these lines for? And then the handball team would come in and it was just so much fun. Like I watched pitchers, like really good pitchers throw heat, but like the athleticism to like move around people and just fire like a 90 mile an hour fastball. I'm like, that's awesome. It's such a cool sport. It's so active. It's so fun. It like combines all of these things. So yeah, listeners out there, check out handball. I definitely think that's something that would that, I always look at like exercise, like I hate running. I hate it. And I just, but I have to do it. But I always want to do something that's going to be fun. Like basketball is fun to me still, but like, it's not as fun. It's like, if I could go and kick a soccer ball around and exercise, it's so much more fun to me because I don't have to, you know, think about it. I'm just out there having fun like a kid. So handball would be like something that I need to take up to stay in shape because that's incredible. Yeah. Next time you're in Pittsburgh, come to a practice. Because oh, we, could use, we could use your size anyway. It's great. It's, it's so fun. And you are running the whole time and playing. You don't realize how gassed you are because you're having fun. It's like playing racquetball. You know, you, you just, that's the plan. I don't like to run either, but I'll run back and forth chasing a ball. Yeah. That's, there was like a big dude and I thought he was my teammate. You know, we all, our locker rooms are all kind of there. It was just like, I was like, does he play basketball? To like one of my teammates, they're like, handball. I was like, oh, Jesus. I was like, hi, hey, never mind. <laughs> I was like, he's a big dude. So going into, uh, now going into the author uh, portion of it, which is incredible. Uh, your, your book, Kings, of, Kings on the Bluff, uh, about Duquesne uh, 1955 National Championship. Uh, such a great read. See, I'm like a, I'm a big, I love stories of triumph. I love stories that like everyone, 
you know, kind of comes together. It's like, that's why we watch Hoosiers and that's why we watch all of these different like small town things. Uh, so this was really well put together. Kings, uh, Kings in the Bluff. Was it something when you got to Duquesne, you kind of learned the story or you were, you were kind of like, you knew about this and you wanted to expand on it? Or was this something you're like, holy shit, like this is an incredible story. Like we need to, we need to get this going. No, I'm, I'm a sports geek too when it comes to those stories, right? And I love that small town, like, you know, old that feel from like 1950s basketball where like a community would rally around a team of like eight guys, you know, and then, you know, like, like the Hoosiers feel. So I have a soft spot for old timey sports. Like we're much, the athletes were much more human, you know, and, and it's really pure in terms of like community pride. And we don't have super spread multimedia that, you know, makes every, every even bench warmer a, a superstar. So um, I have a soft spot for that era of sports. And um, so I knew that story before I came even to be a student at Duquesne. That's, this is my alma mater. I'm very fortunate to teach at my alma mater. And, um, you know, so I had, I had observed Duquesne basketball, listened to Ray Goss, the like longtime 60 year, you know, plus voice of the Dukes at night on the radio while I'm going to bed, you know, that, that kind of thing. So I, I know the story. And then when I got to be a student and I started reading some sports history books, I kept coming across the same name over and over again. His name's David Finoli, F-I-N-O-L-I. And uh, Dave, you know, had written a bunch of books called like Steel City Gridirons. And um, I, I'm blanking on, a, on a, he's written like 30 of these books on the history of sports in Western PA, where I'm from. So I got to know the name and I saw he had a website and I just reached out to him and started emailing him like, hey, I noticed your list of like, Pittsburgh area teams that have won national titles, like not just the Super Bowls and the Stanley Cups, but like you had like my football team from college on there in 2003. You had a couple of like Division two and three schools also winning national titles. And then I saw the 1955 NIT champs and I said, hey, kudos to you, David. That was the national title in 1955. That was the best tournament. And it was up until like maybe the early 60s. It was at least on par with the NCAA title. And people sort of saw the NIT champ as the best team. And he goes, no, that's definitely a national title. You know, I mean, I, it wasn't an NCAA title, but people used to skip the NCAA tournament to go to the NIT. It was that big a deal. And that was the case with Duquesne many times. And he said um, to me one day, and this was like maybe 20 years ago, he's like, I'm going to write, probably write a book on that team. Well, years had gone on, years had gone on. And I started teaching here at Duquesne. And then I stayed in touch with Dave. And he finally said to me, do you want to be a partner on this book? You know, would you like to write part of the, the, the story of that 1955 NIT championship team? And I was like, oh, hell yeah. You know, like, why not? And so I actually got my father-in-law um, got sick and needed a new organ. He needed a liver. And so if he didn't get a liver, he was going to die. And so I volunteered to give him mine during the summer of 2016, right before my second kid was born. Because as a teacher, I'm off in the summer, more or less. So I said, I'll give you mine. And then while I was recovering, he and I just sat on his recliners and watched like the entire Breaking Bad series and recovered from our liver surgeries. And then um, I wrote my portion of the book over those, those two, three weeks. Um, and so during those two or three weeks, I just hunkered down big time with this. There's a history of Duquesne University book called The Spirit That Gives Life that goes into, is written by Dr. Rischel here. I want to say like maybe 20, 25 years ago, this guy wrote this book and he goes really into deep detail about like the Duquesne University basketball history. And like, I looked up the sport magazine story about it's like Hugo Green and you can tell I left some research in this book. And I just went into the history of Duquesne basketball and I wrote like, gosh, probably like 30,000 words on what has happened to the program since 1955. Why did they go from being the best team in the country to not even making the NCAA tournament in like 40 years? And um, that was my contribution to Kings on the Bluff. Dave wrote the game-by-game -game recap that you've written, that you've read, Kevin, and, the, and then all the way through the NIT playoffs. But then I got to write what has happened since and figure out, like, why did the, did the university de-emphasize basketball? Why did they do that? You know, how much of the identity of the university goes into whether or not you have a successful basketball team or whether or not it's about our Catholic mission. And um, the book did very well. I mean, we... we self-produced this book self-published it ever since we've started to sign on with book publishers like arcadia and the history press and we've done well there too but kings on the bluff which we self-published we made some good money on because we own everything about it and what i'm hopeful for and dave and i are both hopeful for is that when the ncaa tournament finally invites duquesne university back that'll be a pretty big national story because it's been so long people will dust off the memories and go 
did you know that as of like the early 80s, Duquesne was one of like the top five or six most successful basketball teams ever, which is true. Um, Duquesne basketball was a powerhouse all the way through the 60s. Um, great, great teams in the 30s, 40s, and the 50s. And uh, it was, for Pittsburghers, one of the you know hallmarks of, of excellence sports-wise in this city. It's hard to imagine. But back before the Steelers won any Super Bowls, back even before the 1960 World Series, I mean, Pittsburgh went a very long time without celebrating any kind of major sporting success. But Duquesne basketball was like the premier athletic team in town. So this book like recaptures that. Um, and then we updated it when Keith Danbrock got hired and added another chapter. We called it Kings on the Bluff, the next chapter. The, the hopefulness is that with the new arena, with Keith here, you know, that we can, with you know, this new name, image, and likeness coach and the new strength center, that ever, the pieces are in place now to compete again. But didn't TJ McConnell go oh, to God, uh, Duquesne for two years before he transferred? TJ McConnell, he went there, right? TJ McConnell is a, is a Pittsburgher, yeah. And so he yeah. did go here. His, um, his high school teammate uh, for the, from the basketball team at Chartiers Valley is now in the NFL. He was a Duquesne Duke as well. It's Christian Kuntz, he's the long snapper now for the Steelers. Um, and so TJ, you know, he is – one of the many Charval graduates, I guess, for some reason, this little school district in Western PA is producing these, you know, major league athletes. But yeah, uh, TJ went here for a couple of years and then he transferred and finished his career two years at Arizona. I mean, he, he was, he was almost the epitome of like, how, why are we losing these kids? You know, I think, that, why are we, what are we doing wrong? And what TJ, um, interesting story, his grandfather, TJ McCollum's grandfather was at a eighth grade girls Catholic basketball championship game that I was covering as a news reporter. I was covering this Diocese of Pittsburgh eighth grade girls basketball championship game at Oakland Catholic High School. Uh, and at the game, I saw TJ McConnell's grandfather and I went and said hi and introduced myself. And then I said, hey, I hope TJ sticks around with us. And he goes, you know, it's just not a lot of big men, not getting a lot of assists. He goes, it's hard to, you know, he goes, this guy wants to make the NBA. And I said, no, I get it. No one will blame him for it, you know? And then lo and behold, he went ahead and did it. So everybody kept doubting TJ. Like, why, you know, why are you transferring? This is a great thing. You get to play in your hometown, but it's hard to argue that he didn't make the right call. Man, that's uh, TJ's, his toughness is that Western Pennsylvania toughness. I feel like there's, yeah, what's like, the, we need to do like some kind of poll of like, where is just Pennsylvania the toughest place in the world? Like, I feel like I've heard so many, so much about Western PA toughness, like the TJ's. And then you hear about like the, the Philly toughness and like, you have that kind of like, I mean, is, is Pennsylvania really one of the toughest places? I guess like Texas would probably be pissed if we were talking about this, but I think there's like the, you pr it produces some really tough kids. Cause I know TJ's tough as nails. Tough yeah, it's definitely, definitely part of the ethos. Right. I mean, it's, it's the whole steel mill persona and it's, it's the lunchbox persona, you know, that stuff gets, that stuff becomes, built just slammed into your head you know like i can be a college professor and still consider myself blue collar and people will laugh because no it's really a mentality my father was an electrician you know like um you know my mother's a stager and she's the she's the physically strongest person i've ever met she'll like pick up a couch and move it herself you know she's just, <laughs> like these it's just that that kind of is a source of pride so yeah hustle and effort and grit get championed here you know i think a lot of places like to think that they do that too but it's really part of the identity and the fabric of like pittsburgh built the country you know, when it was a major city and, uh, and then the sports teams, if they don't embody that, you know, then, then, then they're sort of um, betraying the identity. So we, we want our athletes to embody that. So if they're not tough, if they can't take a hit, if they don't, you know, play through pain, if they don't hustle, then they're never going to fit in. It's so true. And I think that's such a, you know, something that you probably talk to your media people about, but like you said, that Pittsburgh toughness, that Philly toughness, like as a Philly, like a, you know, Philadelphia fan, this whole Ben Simmons thing is like wild because you're like, it's just not us. Like you said, we're such a blue collar. Like you put your hard hat on, you go to work, you work as hard as you can every second, second on the court. And you have some athletes who come here and they're just like, nah, that's not me. And you can't determine really. I mean, that's like, it's almost like one of those things where if you're a GM, like I understand talent, but like you kind of have to line them up. Like they did. I think Bryce Harper has that, has that toughness. I think Joel Embiid does, but uh, it's tough as a GM. You, you kind of have to take into account the cities like Pittsburgh and the cities like Philly that have that blue collar, tough mentality. You need to match the players with that or else the fans are just going to like destroy you. Yeah. I mean, 
the money is the working class fans are the money. I mean, they're the ones that have to turn up. You're going to have 3000 people who can afford like the nice tickets and have a good experience at the game, for example, or, you know, um, are going to be, you know, work for corporate sponsors and they're getting the handout tickets because that's where the big money comes from. But the people who are going to actually consume the game in bars, buy the jerseys, you know, buy the, buy the middle, middle class uh, price tickets. Those are the working class and blue collar class, you know? So yeah, I'm with you. If you can't, if somebody betrays the identity of the team, you know, uh, they're never going to last here, you know, like, like Antonio Brown in Pittsburgh, for example, um, you know, he was never, he always put himself first, you know, talking football here. So yeah, he was always the last one off the field. You could say he really worked hard and that part was great, but he always put himself first. Right. And that was, that's not being part of the team or part of the squad. And so if you're, if you're working on a blue collar job and you're, let's say it's a construction job or a steel mill job, you know, those jobs, if you do anything outside of what's expected of you and you don't do your job, someone gets hurt, you know, or it can be dangerous. Like if someone could, you could put somebody at risk, you know, and, and if you don't pick it up, then everybody else has to stay later and pick up your slack for you. So yeah, putting yourself ahead of the team is always really bad in those markets too. I think it's not like we don't really want the superstar. I can't really speak for Philly as much as I, I can speak for Pittsburgh, but you don't want the one big superstar who doesn't care about if the team wins or not. Right. Because we don't just root for you. We root for the shield. We root for the, the name of the city that's on the front of the Jersey um, because it means something to the people who work here, who live here. You know, that's, that's us winning. It's, we say we, we refer to the team when the team succeeds. So yeah. And that's why I think that's why Antonio Brown, Le'Veon Bell, like those people, they may have made the Steelers better, but people were happy to see him go. Yeah. I think that's, uh, you know, we just have these blue collar cities and I think that's, I think I almost like that better than being a fan of like Miami or LA. I mean, you should, you watch the NBA finals and Miami fans are strolling in, in the you know second quarter. It's just not that important. If they win, they're going to celebrate like for us, for those, us, our kinds of cities, it's like everything like sports or everything. Like I'm still demoralized about the Eagles game. I'm still demoralized that the Phillies lost last night. Like these are the things that, that like keep you up at night, but yeah. I get that. Yeah. And, you I'm know, I'm a big some, Steelers fan too. So I could definitely second those Steelers takes. Matt, where did that awesome. come from? You're a Steelers yeah. fan? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big Steelers fan. My mom is from outside of Pittsburgh. Oh, okay. My family's from out there. That's how it works. Yeah. I mean, it's passed down. I, I lived in Utica for a year when I worked up in New York for college athletics. And I remember um, there were three Steelers bars in Utica, New York. Like, I mean, it's not a big downtown, but there were three Steelers bars. And and, and you go in there and the people are this, why, why are you from, why, why are you such a fan? Well, I'm from Youngstown, Ohio, or I'm from, you know, Erie, PA. And then you hear people say, oh, my dad or my grandfather is from Oil City or, you know, Indiana, PA or from Murraysville, like just or in the Pittsburgh area. And you're like, oh, I, I get it because that's exactly what was passed down to you. <laughs> you know, no matter anything else that you take from this family, you're not going to root for a team other than the Steelers, right? I get it. I think that's the best parenting a parent can do because I always look at parents, like I'll ask kids and they'll be like, wear like a Mets shirt. And I'm like, ew, like, why are you wearing a Mets shirt? This is like Philadelphia country. And they'll be like, no, my dad is from Queens. My mom's from Queens. We moved down here. I was like, okay, your parents are awesome because they brought with them their traditions. They didn't just sell out and be like, oh, we're going to root for the home team. Like they yeah. were real fans. And I feel like that's the year, but like, why do you like the Cowboys? I'm like, Troy Aikman, Emmett Smith. I'm like, you're an idiot. Like, you don't, you don't, you're not a fan. Like you just like, you're just like winners. Like, I just think if you're a parent, and you move, like I always say, like if you move from Philly or you move from Pittsburgh and you move to another area and you're still a diehard fan of your team and your kids are raised that way, that's just great parenting right there. Because it's not easy because your kids are going to end up wanting to hang out with their friends and be part of the group and be like, nope, you're wearing this Eagles jersey to school. I don't care. Yeah. Where you this know, is yeah. Doing. <laughs> yeah. Those of us who, those of us who understand the, the communicative power of sports, because we love them and live them, understand that the tradition that comes with your fanhood and your fandom only is because you have a fond memory growing up, you know, in an environment that was branded for you. Like for me, it was watching baseball with my dad when I was five and it was 1988 and we're watching the pirates, you know, and it's like, so I'm, and he, I saw him get excited about something and it's your father. So it's like, Oh, that made him happy and excited. So this must be good. And so like for me, I'm, my daughters, like they play softball and, you know, my oldest, I took her to her, uh, her first pirates game and they're a bad team this year as usual. And, you know, but like they're, 
But I said, you know, but this is, you're still a Pittsburgher and this is the most beautiful park. Let's, you know, let's go to the game and wear the black and gold. And there was a walk-off grand slam on fireworks night. And I took a picture with her and um, the, the, the story I told about sharing this with her, you know, I told this little Twitter story about it. The mayor of Pittsburgh retweeted it and it got like, you know, hundreds of thousands of views because he gets it. You know, if you're from there, you get it. You pass this stuff on. And so her affection for that team will never wane, no matter even if she goes to live in Miami one day or even like you know, Denmark, it won't matter. She'll remember something that her dad taught her that they experienced together. And that's that's what sports can do. It's so communicative. It's so filled with values. Um, and we pass those on. I was going for five Ben Simmons jokes. I got three in today, but I think that's good <laughs> enough. Um, Robert, this is really cool to sit down and talk to you. Um, and I love, I love conversations where you can just talk sports. I mean, we, we, we talk overseas basketball, but I think there's so many times uh, when you want to kind of hone in on some of these things and your sports media uh, program is, is, is such a great idea. And it's really, uh, it's really doing a, a wonders with, I know Michaela enjoys it thoroughly. And we talk to her all the time about how, uh, how much she really enjoys going to school, which is not something that always happens. I mean, I'm, we're like, Hey, can we schedule a meeting? And she's like, yeah, I have a meeting with, you know, this here at nine o'clock, this here at 10 o'clock. And then we can meet after that. And I'm like, Holy shit. Like <laughs> you're really committed. And that's a testament to you, uh, you know, as a professor to have these kids so into this and, and really loving this program. So we're excited for that. We're excited that this thing grows and we're excited that other cities kind of, you know, take note and start building these programs and you kind of, you know, become that pioneer. That, that means a lot. Thank you. Um, that's, that's our superpower as teachers is the next generation. You know, how, how are we going to change the world? It's, it's through that, you know, so with Michaela, she's going to make the world a better place, you know, and, and that's, and she's going to do it with something that through sports, which can be done. I think it, it, it can be done in that, in that industry. So that means a lot. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And she's going to be great. She's going to do wonderful things. We appreciate you so much. And uh, Kings in the Bluff, uh, buy it on Amazon, check it out, especially um, uh, we're excited to for Duquesne to kind of get that rise, all these new things. So look for Duquesne. Uh, we're not going to tell you to bet on them, but look for them uh, this year in the tournament. And, uh, you know, hopefully they'll they'll make it there and really start growing back to where they were back then. Robert, it was, it was awesome. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. And we will talk to you soon. All right, fellas. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Matt, great job. Little short. Thank you. You too. Overseas yeah, it's not too long. No, a little short, a little, little short and uh, getting in and out. But an interview with Robert Healy, obviously, Kings in the Bluff. Check it out, everyone. Uh, this is Matt and Kevin, Overseas Famous Podcast. See you guys.